Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear me all right? The wonders of modern science. I must confess, when I'm on the way up here, uh, having just read um, the uh, new Robert Harris novel, uh, a, uh, a second, uh, second sleep, uh, that's all about a post-apocalypse world. I knew it. I was astonished to find the Society of Antichrists. <laughs> and the Society of Antichrists, uh, in his book, uh, was a hotbed of criminal heresy. <laughs> uh, it had, became a prescribed organisation. Its officers, I'm sad to report, they were all arrested and put in prison for criminal heresy. And their books were all burnt as well. So you must have wondered what kind of place you were coming to. <laughs> I can tell you that it's fiction, um, and so we shouldn't worry too much. But uh, the one thing which uh, reminded me of what I'm going to be talking about was the burning of the books. And of course, Henry was a great book burner. Uh, there are many aspects of Henry's life which resemble very closely the totalitarian states in Europe. Uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, 50s and 60s. Book burning was one of them, either for heresy or he didn't like what was printed in, him, in them. And we'll talk about some of that uh, later on. Now Henry, of course, has been defined recently much more by his marriages and rather trite television dramas uh, than by whom he truly was. And I think it's time to reassess England's most famous monarch uh, as a man merely that rather than being a mere showbiz character which he has become. Happily, uh, his embryo civil service has left us thousands of documents that reveal the minutiae of his life and much more can be found elsewhere uh, in, for example, the archives of the Vatican and the city-state of Venice. If one is brave enough to stray far from the well-beaten path of his six marriages, uh, we can construct a fuller, much more rounded picture of this autocratic king. New research has uncovered much more about his physical and mental condition in his last years and just how ruthless he became in eliminating his enemies. On the 9th of May, 1540, the chapter of the most noble order of the Garter, meeting for their annual feast in Windsor, confronted a disagreeable item on their agenda. Three of the 24 knight companions had been executed for high treason. Should their names besmirch the register of members, or should they be scratched out as they deserve? Some maintain that the beautifully illustrated book would be made ugly by these erasures. So the chapter sought the Thelomic uh, wisdom of Henry VIII, who had given them the volume, volume six, weeks, six years I'm sorry, before. The register should remain untouched, he decreed, save for the derisive Latin phrase, va proditor, fie on you traitor, being inserted above the Malefactor's name. It always helps to press the right button. <laughs> Entries for Thomas Cromwell, elected a Garter Knight in 1537, but executed for treason in July 1540, were among the first defaced, and there's Cromwell's name, with a uh, prototype written on the top. His name appeared several times in the, uh, in the uh, register. And it's quite interesting, one of those erasures, Prodotus has been stroked out, obviously, by a supporter of Cromwell. <coughs> so, the Tudors were always a threatened dynasty because of their te tenuous and legally fragile claim to the throne of England. This was based on the descent of Henry's formidable grandmother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, from John of Gaunt, the fourth son of Edward III. And uh, this rampant insecurity was the chief motivator behind the king's determination to neutralize any opposition of any kind to his rule. And it was shared and suffered by future Tudor monarchs. In 
Henry's case, uh, there were also psychological factors driving the uh, autocratic rule. His self-obsessive behavior comfortably fits into the classic profile of an individual suffering from grandiose and narcissistic behavior disorder, characterized by exaggerating feelings of self-importance, an excessive need for admiration, and a chronic lack of empathy towards others. When boxed into a corner, he would lash out violently. Ladies and gentlemen, you might well recognize that some of today's <laughs> readers uh, may, may, may well suffer from this disorder. In Henry's case, the sure conviction that he ruled with divine approval intensified the symptoms immeasurably. When God's deputy on earth was on his knees praying, he always knew that God listened. In later years, I believe he was also afflicted by Cushing syndrome, a rare endocrine <coughs> abnormality caused by excessive levels of uh, the hormone cortisol, probably caused by the traumatic head injury he suffered whilst jousting in 1536. Henry became paranoid, if not psychotic, deeply suspicious of all those around him, even those he loved. Now Henry regarded treason as the most heinous of crimes, and a raft of new penal measures was introduced to punish those who challenged the king's ecclesiastical supremacy after the break with Rome, or his entitlement to the crown. Up to his reign, treason was defined by an act of 1351 that described the crime as plotting the monarch's death, waging war upon him, or aiding and abetting his enemies. And in passing, I should mention that the statute still remains on the statute book, much amended, and recently there's been quite a lot of debate about its application to returning jihadists. The last time it was deployed, was during the trial of William Joyce, Lord Hawhaw, in 1945. After Henry's new legislation, the law now judged miscreants to be traitors simply if they didn't follow his predictions in religious institutions and beliefs, refused to support his latest choice of wife, or the changing status of his offspring. And from 1532 to the king's death in early 1547, there were 970 treason trials in England and Wales, resulting in 336 executions when the condemned faced the horrible traitor's death of being hanged, drawn, and quartered. 216 of these were executed after the Northern Rebellions of 1536-37, and a further 15 for their involvement uh, in the Yorkshire Conspiracy of 1541. Now, the Tudors invented propaganda in its modern sense, in what we would recognize as propaganda. They utilized the power of the printing press. They used drama, spectacle, and pageantry to manipulate Henry's subjects' minds. Now, they would, they would uh, create laws which ruled not only what uh, people thought, what people said. Defaming the monarch by written or spoken word became a capital offence, such as branding him a heretic, schismatic, tyrant, infidel, or usurper. 64 were executed, another 10 died in prison in 1532-40 for uttering felonious words. These included disparaging comments on the king's love life, uh, his ability to procreate, criticism of his ministers or policies, or spreading rumour about popular dissatisfaction or unrest. So, if we live today under the mailed fist of Henry's laws, I would be guilty of high treason for flagrantly writing the rather unflattering statements about the old despot in my new book. <laughs> if you read those perilous words aloud, or lent my book to a friend, so would you. You would be liable 
for that uh, one-way trip to the scaffold. Luckily for everyone today, here today, and indeed my book sales, uh, <laughs> these punitive measures were repealed in 1547. One class of traitor escaped Henry's vengeance, but never his wrath. Those renegades who defected to the papal uh, cause and escaped to Europe. The king always demanded their immediate extradition, and when these legal uh, moves failed, as mostly they did, I was happy to order these fugitives' abduction or murder. Chief amongst them was Cardinal Reginald Pole, whom Henry castigated as England's arch-traitor. Pole fought tooth and nail to defend Holy Mother Church and became a magnet to the disaffected. He had told Henry, your butchers and butcheries and horrible executions have made England the slaughterhouse of innocence. As the king had massacred his kith and kin in 1539 and 1541, one can sympathize. When Paul was dispatched to France in 1537 to seek support for the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, Henry demanded his arrest and repatriation. Uh, but Francis I of France, you can see why his subjects called him Old Long Nose, <laughs> Francis I in France found himself in a difficult position between the proverbial rock and hard place. On one hand, he's got a monarch demanding that he fulfills his treaty obligations, on the other hand, he has the Pope bearing down on him, telling, telling him not to touch a hair of Pope's head. So Francis merely banished the Cardinal to the Spanish Low Countries. Henry was incensed and sought to secretly appoint some fellows to kidnap the Cardinal, adding, we would, very glad, we would, we would be very glad to have Pole trussed up and conveyed to Calais which was then the last English stronghold on the European mainland. His chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, also launched, launched a covert operation, sending Sir Thomas Palmer and four accomplices into Flanders to assassinate him with handguns. But Pole escaped Henry's vengeance, despite the reward of 100,000 crowns upon his head. Um, alive or dead. Now, in today's money, that's just over 15 million pounds. And as a point of comparison, you see even the CIA only have, have a prize, uh, prize money of 7.7 .7 million for leading uh, jihadists uh, being captured, being recaptured and killed. About 130 lesser clergy or laymen with allegiance to the religion of their forefathers fled England between 1534 and 1546. And Henry's feverish attempt to lay hands on them is a sorry tale of frustration, dipl diplomatic fiasco, and sometimes farcical mishap. Aside from Pole, there was one traitor that fed Henry's neuroses more than any other, the so-called Blanche Rose, who was hiding in France. And his nom de plume, Blanche Rose, is the clue to the Henry's ill at ease, as it suggested that he claimed to be a long lost member of the House of York. The White Rose threat to the Tudor crown believed finally neutralized when the king destroyed, destroyed Pole's extended family. But in reality, this man of mystery was one of Henry's subjects called Dick Hoosier the son of a cobbler or tailor who had spent eight years in a stinking Parisian prison. After his release, the king sought his arrest and repatriation, but the French procrastinated, uh, claiming that he was born in Orléans, even though he could barely string together a few words of their own tongue. The affair rumbled on for some years with Henry's ever more irascible demands for the return of this detestable traitor and murderer, meeting with the blank wall of French obduracy. The final demand for his expedition was included in the ultimatum, delivered as a prelude to war with France in June 1543.
So diplomacy has failed Henry. To his fury, his brother monarchs refused to fulfill their chief treaty obligations and to hand over those traitors and rebels who had escaped his retribution. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and were now busy plotting against him on the continent of Europe. It was time for more direct action. <coughs> Henry's frequent forays into the clandestine world of kidnapping, blackmail, and assassination have not received the attention they deserve. <coughs> For example, he apparently planned to kidnap his nephew, uh, James V of Scotland, to compel him to acknowledge English suzerainty over Scotland. He also tried to abduct Cardinal Mark Grimani, the papal legate of Scotland, whose, whose ship narrowly escaped an ambush on the high seas and who later evaded another kidnap attempt by fleeing Glasgow in dawn in disguise. In May 1546, another of the King's Bet Noirs, Cardinal David Beaton, the self-appointed Lord Chancellor of Scotland, was assassinated in his castle in St Andrews. Henry had agreed to fund the murder, provided that he was not implicated publicly, as his involvement in the conspiracy, he stressed, with sublime hypocrisy, was not meet for a king. In, uh, at dawn, the 29th of May, 17 assassins broke into the, the, the castle's gatehouse. They killed the porter and hurled his body down into the ditch. The noise brought Beaton out, Beaton out of his chamber, and he was promptly hacked to death. His mutilated corpse was thrown out of a window and left hanging in midair, tied hand and foot by a pair of sheets, as an object lesson to others who might consider messing with Henry Tudor. A string of further assassination attempts was also mounted against Pole, but all proved unsuccessful. A compelling solution appeared in 1544, while the English uh, were besieging the French port and stronghold of Boulogne. A dashing Italian mercenary colonel appeared one day in their trenches and had the temerity to scoff just how, just how badly the siege was being conducted. He made no effort to hide his contempt at the amateurish efforts of the English troops. Knee deep in foul mud and water, with French cannonballs whistling about their ears, the English found him a thoroughly irksome visitor, particularly as he was well dressed, clean, handsome, and worse still, a know it all foreigner. <laughs> Sir William Paget, Secretary of State, told uh, John Lord Russell this Italian, who was called <coughs> Ludovico Delami, was a subject of the Bishop of Rome, who had previously served the French government. He was the nephew of the gouty Cardinal Lorenzo Copeggio, who with Wolsey had presided over the abortive tribunal at Blackfriars on Henry's divorce uh, from Catherine of Aragon back in 1529. And uh, he certainly wasn't Henry's favorite cardinal. Russell, um, thoroughly mistrusted Italian mercenaries, declaring neither he nor any other Italian should have tarried there in the trenches and seen our doings, for I know well their natures and treasons. Despite that black mark put up by his uncle, Henry recruited Delamy ostensibly to hire mercenaries illegally in Venice, but in reality to murder Pole. He was the king's gangster, the perfect criminal type, vain, violent, plausible. He was brash, swaggering, bursting with Italian charm and brio, and utterly, utterly ruthless. In January 1545, Delarmi arrived in Venice on a generous monthly salary of 50 crowns, or about 6,000 pounds a month in today's money. That uh, year, 
the three Venetian magistrates commissioned four religious paintings to decorate their headquarters uh, in this palazzo just up from the Rialto Bridge. One was the slaughter of the innocents, depicting the New Testament story of the massacre of the infant, infants by Herod soldiers. The arch-shaped picture, now in the Academia in Venice, shows a tall, bearded figure nonchalantly watching the murder and mayhem going on around him. Next to him stands a retainer holding a shield with a coat of arms. This heraldry belongs to the Delami family and his elegant dress resembles that worn by the assassin later when he was arrested. This must be Henry's gangster. If so, this painting must be considered the most expensive wanted poster in the history of criminology. <laughs> in Rome, Cardinal Niccolo, Niccolo Ardinghelli, the newly appointed prefect of the Apostolic Signatura, and heavily involved in the Holy See's secret services, feared Delami's presence in, it in Italy. He probably planned and paid for the unsuccessful attempt to assassinate him uh, in Italy that March, staged by a mercenary captain called Secondo, backed by a team of 12 desperados. On the 5th of May, uh, Arding Heli summoned Francesco Venier, the Venetian ambassador to the Vatican, for a confidential chat over a glass or two of good Italian vino. He revealed that Henry kept a number of persons in his pay in diverse places for some purpose which must be considered sinister. Uh, his character being such as it is. One of them was Delarmi, whom the Vatican demanded should be expelled immediately from Venice, lest it appears that he enjoys the Doge's favour. The Venetian ambassador was worried about the implication of this. Uh, he feared that Henry would retaliate against the quite large community of Venetian merchants in London, and knowing his rapaciousness, uh, could happily confiscate their valuable investments in England. Querulously, he suggested, uh, might it not be more prudent to proceed somewhat moderately with Henry? A cardinal rustly swept aside such caution. His holiness does not require the Signori to do as he would do if he could get hold of Delami, who is his rebel and has committed so many crimes. Instead, the Pope merely required his expulsion, <coughs> lest through the Signori's protection he may find an opportunity for perpetuating some enormous outrage. The Venetian knew very well what Arling Henry was talking about. He had heard whispers in the Vatican corridors that Delami was plotting some mischief and had some treacherous design against Cardinal Pole, attending the church council at Trento. Three days later, the ambassador found himself kneeling before 77-year-old Pope Paul III, who was anxious to learn of what firm action was planned by the city-state against Henry's assassin. He disclosed that Delarmi and his accomplices were planning a terrible crime, and uh, the latest intelligence indicated they were only awaiting Henry's commission to be delivered by a gentleman of his privy chamber who was expected in Venice during the next 12 days. We see this villain close at hand, said the Pope. He is our rebel and on many counts would deserve a thousand deaths. We perceive that the King of England, who is a heretic, has no other enmity in Italy other than ours, and in several quarters he is plotting I know not what mischief. Should any disturbance arise, it would be unfitting for it to have originated in Venice. Paul added, the council is sitting in Trento. We do not know what direction Henry's thoughts might take. There is a particular case of Cardinal Pole, whom these ruffians may have ordered, been ordered to kidnap or take some other sinister action against. The new doge, just appointed, Francesco Donato, 
and the city's council of ten were then honoured by a visit by the papal nuncio, who reinforced the Pope's demands with some warmth. They responded by summoning the army for questioning in the ducal prison. But the bird had flown. He had departed Venice, reportedly on the king's business, and the Signori were alarmed to discover that he'd gone to Trento. Whatever his mission was, it went unfulfilled. Pole remained alive and well, and went on in Mary I's reign to become the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. By August 1545, Delamy was back in Venice and had his own personal scores to settle. He was involved in a running battle with the Venetian, Venetian Night Watch, in which one guard was badly wounded, and the penalty for this crime was death. Edmund Harvel, the English ambassador, explained it was all a dreadful mistake, as Delamy had mistaken the watch for a gang of his enemies. The Venetians meekly but meekly believed this glib, glib uh, explanation and were prepared to overlook the matter to please Henry, whom they held in great reverence. They also valued their alliance with England. However, it was then revealed that Delamy had hired assassins to murder an army officer in Treviso. Uh, they had stabbed and slashed at him two or three times with swords, which he survived, before they clambered back over the city walls to escape. One assailant was captured later, rather stupidly hiding in Delamy's house in Venice. The assassin was now a wanted man with a price of 100 pounds on his head. Brazenly, he called at Harville's official residence and explained that the attempted murder was only an act of hot-blooded vengeance for the victim's theft of a mercenary fee. Harvard couldn't uh, reassure him on his safety, so he rode post-haste uh, to England via Brussels and on to Henry's court, where he spent a few months carefully building the persona of a faithful servant wrongfully accused. Sir William Padgett, the Secretary of State, now thoroughly approved of him, writing admiringly of his vengeful wit, and that he was naturally disposed to work mysteries. He added chillingly, such a man at such a time is to be cherished. Henry, who was now nearing his end, required that the Venetians grant his agents a five-year safe conduct, but this was rejected by the Council of Ten for the Peace of Venice, Five days later, they reversed their decision for His Majesty's gratification and by reason of our ancient friendship with him. In November 1546, the Italian merchant banker, Maffio Bernardo, was killed brutally in a pine forest near Ravenna. He had been stabbed 18 times. A letter was found in his bloodstained doublet that had been given by an army to the cutthroats, his intimate comrade. A warrant for the banker's arrest had only been issued by the Venetian authorities after allegations that he had divulged state secrets and had been involved in treacherous and treasonous negotiations with the France. With France. So the motive for this killing, this murder, remains unclear. Was Delamy involved in his own secret traitorous dealings with the French? Did he fear that Bernardo knew too much? about his own conspiracies, so did he have to silence him before he could blab? Delamy wrote to Henry after hearing that his master was so ill that the doctors had no hope of his living, and his sorrow was turned to joy by a subsequent report that the rumour was quite false, and he obsequiously thanked the king for his continued munificence. This letter was probably triggered by Harville's growing suspicions about his sinister activities. Three weeks before, the ambassador dispatched a messenger to London to deliver by word of mouth warnings about Delamy's proceedings, which the king should know. He begged Paget to keep such things secret, for all I have written of him has been disclosed to him, and he has moved against me. 
The assassin wrote, on, wrote again to Paget on the 11th of December from Venice, including a casual reference to his latest escapade. If perchance you hear anything of the death of Maffio Bernardo, which seems to touch my honour, either privately or as the king's servant, tell them who malign me that I have always proved myself studious of my master's honour and my own. Five days later, the Venetians established beyond reasonable doubt that Delarmi had ordered the banker's murder. Again, fear of Henry's displeasure stayed their hand in wreaking justice upon a felon now regarded as being as odious to the state as words can express. If the king opposed his execution to this fresh, out, fresh out, uh, outrage, he should immediately recall him from Venice so that all cause of scandal and disturbance may be removed. In London, Pageant, Pageant, Pageant told the uh, Venetian ambassador that Delarmi was no longer in favour and he was certain that his iniquities, which caused him to be in such disgrace with the entire court, would greatly displease the king. Henry's death in the early hours of the 28th of January 1547 changed everything. Delarmi's commission was immediately cancelled. He fled Venice that month and headed for the, the Duchy of Milan, uh, riding fast on hired horses without servants. Seeking the protection of large crowds, he attended a glittering entertainment but made no effort to look inconspicuous other than wearing a mask. His taste for showy uh, fine clothes became his downfall as it was reported that everyone stared at him. He was recognised and immediately imprisoned in Milan Castle. The Venetians were determined to repatriate uh, Delarmi as soon as possible, and such was his reputation that they sent 200 cavalry and an escort to prevent any, dis any uh, rescue attempt. <laughs> On the journey back, it was ordered that he remained handcuffed, and should he refuse to eat, the food should be forced down his throat. After, of course, first testing it for poison to prevent his suicide. On Sunday, the 11th of May, 1547, the prisoner was condemned to death on Saturday next, when he should be taken between the two pillars in the Piazza San Marco, where, on a lofty scaffold, his head should be severed. But they didn't wait that long to execute him. The rector of a near nearby church was permitted to hear Delami's confession and provide spiritual comfort until his hour of death. Early the next morning, the prisoner was brought out of his cell in the Ducal Prison, and under heavy guard, walked a short distance along the broad waterfront to the place of execution, and his head was severed from his body between those two pillars. The status-conscious city of Venice noted his passing in the official obituary role of noblemen who had died that month. 12th of May, Ludovicio de Lamy beheaded by order of the most illustrious council of ten. The world uh, was finally rid of Henry's gangster. As I said at the beginning, uh, our view of Henry VIII has been defined more by his six marriages and those often inaccurate television dramas rather than by who truly was. I still treasure the memory of one shot in one series of a Boeing 747 jumbo flying over the siege of Boulogne. <laughs> uh, my book, uh, Henry VIII, The Decline and Fall of a Tyrant, covers the last seven years of his reign and reveals a geriatric king crippled by osteomyelitis one could smell the stench of his legs two rooms away, and requiring a primitive lift to hoist him up to the first floor royal apartments, as well as a kind of sedan chair to lift him around. The dashing, athletic Renaissance prince had disappeared long before. He now weighed 178 kil uh, kilograms, or, if you're like me, 28 stone, uh, with a body mass index of 52 kilograms per square meter, 
well off today's National Health Service scale. <laughs> Time was running out for him to achieve his childhood dreams of personal valour, defeating the despised French, and finally fulfilling the ancient English claim to the crown of France. But he had become a vulnerable and lonely old man. The 1542 Whitehall inventory of royal possessions reveals Henry's hidden helplessness. Three walking staffs, all fitted with whistles at the top, are listed as are two leather trunks or loud hailers used for shouting. And the king was rarely alone but now needed to summon help in an emergency by blasts on its whistles or bellowing through his shouting trunk. He dreaded falling down and now required considerable help in getting him back on his feet. Despite his, doc his doctor's pleas, despite eight weeks in bed, he still insisted on invading France in 1544. And he proudly led his host out of Calais, behind the bravely flying green and white Tudor battle ensign, towards Boulogne, where English troops were already digging siege works. A cloudburst of almost tropical intensity at Marquis, 20 miles from Calais, on the 25th of July, was a salutary lesson and a defining moment. <coughs> Standing around in a quagmire of mud, wearing soaking wet clothes, is one thing, but watching your expensive armour rust about you is something quite different. He must have suddenly realised at last that he was medically unfit for a prolonged, arduous campaigning far from home in all <coughs> weathers. His cherished dreams of battlefield heroics evaporated like incense in the Vatican in the grim re realisation of his age and infirm infirmities. The grand strategy for capturing Paris in concert with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, was unilaterally abandoned, and instead Henry was content to capture the Loire. Under papal pressure, his ally made a separate peace with France, leaving Henry to fight on alone. The costs of war bankrupted England, exacerbated by his reckless borrowing at high interest rates from the Antwerp bankers and his fraudulent devaluation of the coinage. It would take his successors more than two decades to rebuild the Tudor economy. His decline continued. Henry never enjoyed paperwork and from 1545, um, he, he uh, gave up uh, signing uh, state papers. His, fa his failing eyesight meant that he bought wire-framed spectacles from Germany, 10 pairs at a time. Clearly, he loses them as regularly as I do. <laughs> and uh, instead of signing state papers, uh, a wooden block with the royal signature carved in raised letters was impressed on documents and the imprint inked in. But of course, there were safeguards against misuse. Documents signed with this dry stamp were listed every month for Henry's approval. But after a year, he even stopped examining this ledger. The king had handed over the levers of power to those around him. So how should we remember uh, Henry VIII? He established the Royal Navy and uh, his diplomacy placed his dominions firmly at the centre of European politics instead of being regarded uh, as a remote group of rain-swept islands on the edge of the known world. Knowing his fondness and jealousy of his sovereignty, I think the European Union would be complete anathema to Henry VIII. Uh, his warships laid the maritime foundations for the creation of the British Empire. Because of that insecurity of the Tudor dynasty, because of the fear that the dynasty could be destroyed, could a heartbeat away, Henry became a rampant 
hypochondriac. And he reformed the medical profession. He outlawed quacks, uh, the impact of religion and superstition, and firmly placed it in the realms of science. His regulatory regime led the foundations of a modern healthcare system. Remember Henry VIII when you next visit your doctor or local hospital. But his dreams were thwarted, even down to the grandiose monument he planned for himself in St. George's Chapel, Windsor, which was still unfinished in his death, despite being worked on since the beginning of his reign. His last remnant is the sarcophagus, which he'd early, earlier filched from Wolsey's tomb uh, and was uh, reused more than 250 years later by a parsimonious government and Nelson's monument in the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral. Despite what we would regard today as his genocide of the civilian inhabitants of Scotland and northern France and the harsh totalitarian regime he inflicted on his hard tax subjects, one can still feel a scintilla of sympathy for the pain-wracked old ogre. The Tudor dynasty was to continue for another 56 years. Many more were to die, uh, as Henry's offspring, like their father, clung on to the crown of England. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen.